to the inner voice. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse podcast and today we've got a great one for you as usual another music and sky festival friend part of the larger constellation of awesome podcasters connected to Alpha Vedic we had an an excellent time getting to a camp next to each other hanging out so following up the great conversation we just had with Eileen McCusick the other person in our little trinity of uh, badass campers was Alex Zek here. So Alec is a systems engineer major from uh, West Point trained and broke out of the mind control spells that society tries to put on us from uh, the, especially during the cooties lockdown madness. And he's been helping people as a personal trainer, coach, and analyzing things like the scientific method and how it's not followed by the science <laughs> trademark. Uh, Alec has a really awesome podcast called The Way Forward. And today we're going to be discussing, it's going to be pretty open conversation to see wherever we go, but I would love to get into what is the scientific, scientific method? Uh, how can we apply knowing the difference between pseudoscience and real science to what we are presented by the science, which is not the same thing. And uh, also really excited to find out what kind of things Alec is building with his membership community and his way forward crew. So without further ado, let's just get right into it. Alec, my man, thank you for coming to hang out with me and welcome to the interverse, dude. Dude, thank you for being my neighbor at uh, Music and Sky. That was cool. Yeah, and I started the last show the same way, but I'd love to hear from you what some of the highlights were, what the experience was like for, for you, you know, let's talk about that more. It deserves, it deserves attention because I want to see even more of the community showing up to the next one and spread this out across the country, do more than one a year. You know, I've done in-person events myself. And I always said with my previous organization, I had health freedom for humanity that my favorite event I've ever been to was our symposium and music and sky blew that out of the water. It was incredible. It's like if, let's put it this way, if a farmer's market and a music festival and let's say like a holistic health conference and maybe an evangelical church service had a baby, it would be music and sky. Like the the best feelings from all those things combined into one place. It was Awesome. Cause like on one stage, there'd be a presentation on something. Like I gave a presentation on logic, science, knowing versus believing. And then on another stage, there's a DJ set on another stage. There's like a sound bath or a meditation. It was, it was awesome. It was incredible. Yeah. You really can't beat that. The combination is as you described plus extra and more. <laughs> yeah. And you hung out with the uh, four of us during that really fun campfire live podcast we did which apparently later today they're going to be premiering on alpha vedic so people can check that out and I'll, I'll mirror that to my channel but alec you know we got to know each other pretty well while we we're hanging out at the event but i would love to introduce you to my audience more fully and learn more about you know where you're coming from how you got to where you are so can you tell us more about your life and your journey yeah for sure so um yeah so i grew up in a pretty traumatic, chaotic environment, um, with my childhood and, you know, typical thing. My dad was just repeating patterns of generational abuse and trauma. And my mom was super codependent. So she was more focused on trying to quote, fix my dad than she was parenting. And 
Um, when I was in seventh grade, my dad went to rehab for a year. And when my dad went to rehab, my mom went to go see a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist didn't talk with her about any of her um, trauma or anything like that, simply prescribed her multiple benzodiazepines and SSRIs. And her health was already in a pretty bad state, but it started spiraling even worse after being prescribed these benzodiazepines and SSRIs. But we didn't know, we didn't have the wherewithal to understand what was happening. So um, her health, health as it continued to get worse, she had sort of these ups and downs, these, these waves that would come. And then her up moments were like, oh my God, these drugs are working. Thank God for these doctors. And then the down moments were like, oh no, she needs to go back to the her psychiatrist and get different drugs. Right. And when I say down moments, it was like not leaving her room for a few weeks at a time, hallucinating, um, in and out of psych hospitals, multiple suicide attempts. It was like super, super dark. And then, um, long story short, I ended up going to West Point because that was the only <laughs> division one school that was recruiting me for basketball. So I, I went to West Point. I had no desire to be in the army or anything like that. It was simply that they were recruiting me for basketball. And then I ended up getting cut from the basketball team when I was there. And while I was at West Point, my mom's health getting worse and worse and worse for me personally. Um, I never had any health issues per se, but I had a lot of trauma that I just stuffed down and then would externalize my self-worth to feel better. And, um, in 2016, right when I graduated from West Point commissioned as an officer in the army, my mom, at this point, we were looking at institutionalizing her and putting her in like a long-term facility because up to this point, it was a, this 10 years of up and down, up and down, getting worse and worse and worse. And my siblings and I had already decided that we're, we weren't going to get close to there um, because it would just be too painful because she'd either succeed in one of her suicide attempts or when she would have these up moments when we would see aspects of her come through, she would inevitably um, revert back to that, that state of psychosis. And so it just became too painful. And by chance, she was seeing a therapist at the time who was reading A Mind of Your Own by Dr. Kelly Brogan. And this therapist said, Hey, Ali, this book is incredible. I highly recommend you, you know, make an appointment to go see Kelly in New York. She's still taking clients in New York. At that time, Kelly still had her license. And so the same weekend that I was graduating from West Point, which happens to be in New York as well, my mom made an appointment to go see Kelly. And then that essentially changed the trajectory of my entire family because my mom started taking steps to truly heal for the first time. Um, and we began seeing sides of her we hadn't seen in 10 years. And then because my mom went on that journey, my, my wife, who I just married at the time, nine years prior was diagnosed with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and, you know, multiple rheumatologists telling her that she was always going to be this way on multiple immunosuppressive drugs, which would of course lead to more symptoms, which would lead to more drugs on this wheel of, you know, pharmacopoeia. And after seeing my mom begin to heal, we decided to try the same approach for my wife. And in a matter of four months, she reversed both lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And now it's been over six years since she's uh, sustained that remission. And so those two things happened, right? Those two, my mom, my wife, drastically healing um, in a matter of a few months, right when I commissioned as an officer in the United States army <laughs> working for the government. So that just sent me down a journey of questioning everything I had been taught to accept and believe. And inevitably that led to a lot of uh, uprooting of trauma and facing a lot of my own shadows and things like that. And then of course, when COVID hit, I could see right through it right away. I was still in the army as an officer actually. And, um, I, I'm thankful for COVID because it pushed me deeper into my own authenticity because I had a religious accommodation for shots in the army. I was transitioning roles in the army. I, I was previously a field artillery officer and I was about to transition into the acquisition corps for the army where I'd essentially be doing contracts with, um, civilian agencies essentially. And I was like, you know what? I, as long as I don't work a combat role, I can morally justify staying a part of this in extremely corrupt, wicked organization. I have a VAX exemption. What's the big deal? And then COVID hit and that 
sort of was my, you know, line. I was like, I'm not, I cannot be a part of this anymore. It's pushed me deeper into my authenticity. So here I am now doing this stuff. <laughs> There's so much to possibly unpack and all of that, man. But, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is the, I've said this before too, thankful for cooties <laughs> because that entire experience really helped me reshape the way I looked at health even further. I mean, I was already pretty along the road, was starting to explore the sound healing modalities that Eileen teaches and, you know, practicing on friends. But at the point that all that was going down, I remember the beginning of it sometime in March where I was like hearing all the, oh, it's spreading. It's super scary. And I had this moment of like, I could die. And I felt this vibration of fear enter my body. And I was like, I could die. And then I noticed it. Oh, like it took about two minutes that I noticed that it come into my body. And I was like, oh, that's what this is. <laughs> it's a energy that's infecting people. It's not really a, there's not a physical thing to it. It's this mind virus. Dude, you know, what's crazy about that is that the CDC's own data indicates the same thing. <clears throat> the second largest risk factor for death, according to the CDC uh, study they did a year and a half ago is fear slash anxiety related disorders. So that means people who had already had a diagnosed fear slash anxiety related disorder had, that was the second largest risk factor for death associated with a COVID label, which is meaningless. And we can get into that, but the, um, the first largest risk factor of course was obesity. So it's, it's, you're, you're on the money, the, the fear, the perpetual fear, the intense fear associated with all the propaganda. And dude, I initially fell for it too, not on the vaccine side of things, but so I was, like I said, still in the army and I was in this school in the army called captain's career course in Oklahoma. And every day and at the beginning of class, someone in our class had to present on news around the world. And in late November, early December of 20 or of 2019, um, one of our classmates started talking about this, you know, new viral outbreak in China. So I went on Reddit and just started researching like crazy because I already knew that they, there's going to be this push for mandatory vaccines at some point because I had been watching the so-called measles outbreak that happened in New York and several other things and what had already happened in California with SB 276 and 277. So I knew they were going to try to find a way to make vaccine, vaccines mandatory for all people. and. I, I fell for the Chinese propaganda, like the state run Chinese propaganda of people falling over in the streets, dying. I was like, holy fuck, they actually succeeded in creating a bioweapon in a lab. We're fucked. Did you see the ones where people were like freezing? Dude, yeah. <laughs> yeah <I laughs> they came up all. with some pretty awesome horror movie viral videos. Good <laughs> they job. They did. They did. And even though I fell for the fear at first, I knew, I knew what the end goal was to be. I just, I really did at the very beginning think, oh my God, 50 million, 60 million people are going to die from this because they finally succeeded in creating a bioweapon in the lab. Because at that time I had not dived into the, the fraud of virology and the germ theory. I knew that the vaccine industry was fraudulent, pharmaceutical industry. I knew natural health was the way to go. My kids weren't vaccinated at all. But I, uh, I fell for the fear, man. And then it was, it was a video that I watched. You might've seen this one too. I think it was like April of 2019 or 2020 where Andy Kaufman was on David Icke and they were talking about how there is no virus. And I was like, this makes sense because it's already supposedly quote hit in the United States. And I'm not seeing people dropping in the streets and shit like that. Oh my God, I fell for propaganda. And then I started looking into the no virus thing and it just made sense intuitively. And I have obsessively researched <laughs> that thing for the last two years now, two plus years. That's been like my thing that I've obsessively researched. So, Yeah, I'm interested in going more into that because honestly, we haven't covered it super deep on the show and my personal rhetoric on the subject matter could get some improvement, but I want to back up a little bit more to your personal story and how like, you know, the healing journey of the family is a really cool thing to maybe emphasize how your journey was connected with your mom and your sister. And like, it's all sort of, you know, we all sort of rise together yeah. and maybe we could speak more on how we reflect our family members or maybe, you know, we all have our own personal health challenges. What, maybe you have learned through working on yourself and what some of your personal 
growth areas were? Yeah. So it's interesting you bring this up because right now, um, my mom and I don't speak at all, despite having this like massive healing trajectory together as a family. It's there's been a lot of other stuff that has happened in the past four to five years that is um sort of made me reflect on my childhood in a different way. And it's not to say that anyone is bad or wrong or anything like that. My parents are both doing the best that they know how, but um I have reestablished a relationship with my dad because he made amends for all the things that happened when I was a child for the first time a year ago, he, he made amends and we have a close relationship again. And now that I'm close with my dad, my mom's averse to that because they're split up. So she's no longer speaking with me. It's this like weird dynamic. And what I've learned from this man is that um, everyone is on their own journey. And what I'm having to reflect on quite a bit is the understanding that those things that happened are not currently happening right now. I am the only one that is perpetuating my own suffering by still having this emotional attachment to those things that happened. And that doesn't mean you just pretend those emotions don't exist, but the more that you stuff them down, the more that they will perpetuate and lead to actual physical symptoms of disease. And that's something that I've been struggling with because I've had a lot of back problems in the last year and it's because I've been stuffing down some of the things that have happened um, with relation to where uh, relating to my relationship between me and my mom. And it's uh, I'm really learning to acknowledge those. And it's, it's, it's interesting because my, my dad, the situation with him was much more obvious because there's a lot of physical abuse there. I mean, he beat the shit out of me when I was growing up. And so it was more, more on the surface, it was easy to identify those things and sort of heal those. And I did a lot of that healing work in 2018, 2019. And, um, with my mom though, it's, it's the dynamic is different because in a way I became her surrogate husband slash caretaker. When my dad was at rehab, I was the one holding her at night, every night while she was bawling, crying, making sure she was okay when I was a 13 year old kid. Right. And then, um, you know, the times that she would be in states of psychosis, I'd be holding her, making sure she was okay. So I was always neglecting my own emotions and my emotions almost became tied to my mom's. Like if my mom was okay, then I was emotionally okay. If my mom was bad, then I was emotionally bad. So I was codependent in a way in relation to my mom. And now that our relationship is, it's, it's like this individuation process that I'm going through. And it's, it's difficult because I had always had my emotions intertwined with my mom. And now that she's not on good terms with me and she doesn't want to associate with me, I've been in this funk almost for the past 10 to 12 months that I've had to ride the waves of and understand that it's because I've still self-identified with her to some degree. So again, when she's bad, when she's not feeling good or when she's upset with me, then I feel bad about myself. So it's this process I've been doing. I kind of rambled there. Hopefully I answered your question to some degree. No, I mean, this is stuff I'm fascinated in. I could never really get too much personal anecdotal information about as somebody that does the biofield tuning process. I can't help but notice you pointed out back problems. It's like lower back problems for you. Yep. Yeah. So in the biofield, the energy of frustration is a left side of the body sacral chakra type energy. So you're like feeling frustrated and resentful. That <laughs> and is two those, perfect words to describe it. Those feelings actually will manifest in lower back pain for people. And it, it's like consistent and it's a left side mother maternal side thing. So, you know, it just proves the validity of Eileen's system, which I didn't need any more proof about, but it's always interesting to see that it's like, yep, this is 100% accurate. And it always pretty much works this way. So, you know, what you described about the codependency situation, I think it has to do with like you, you mentioned this, you just briefly said this phrase of externalizing your, I don't know, self-esteem or virtue <laughs> what we have what i what i think goes on is we have like this inner yin and yang force and our external relationships with the feminine as males are a reflection of our 
balance and health of our left side of our body, of our energy field and our internal yin. So, you know, like the, you were mentioned being like a surrogate husband to your uh, mom, I, to bring up uh, pa my past relationship with my ex-wife. The most frustrating thing for me was that when she would, uh, you know, act up, act out, <laughs> it would be, I would be treated like I was an annoying parent. Like I was her dad and I was annoying, you know? <laughs> and I was like, I'm not a parent. I'm, you know, like we're almost taking on the role of surrogate father there for you. Yes, exactly. So, and that's what happens is like the, the version, the external version of the yin or the yang of the anima or animus for the individual that is closest to them is the most direct reflection of their internal yin or yang. So, you know, it's hard to, uh, it, it actually is kind of like in a way inseparable that your wife or your husband does carry an energetic signature to you that is somewhat re or very strongly related to the parent, you know, it just 100%, is what it is. And especially if we have not done the work to heal those aspects of ourself prior to entering into a relationship, like thank God for my wife, because both of us are on this journey of self-reflection together because the way that I grew up, I naturally attracted someone who was codependent and then she attracted me and I was emotionally unavailable. We've been together since we were 16 years old. So it's, it's been this like long journey, but um, it's amazing because we're both willing to do the work individually to face our shadows and understand that we do have those tendencies and we were attracted to them. And she has her own story with her family. And it's this, this acknowledgement that's important. Um, it's, it's being able to both to hold these two things together. It's that I behaved in very fucked up ways and did very fucked up things right? And like I did early on my, our, my relationship with my wife, I was not a good dude at all. Not even a little bit. I was a teenager, but that's, I mean, anyone can use that as an excuse. I was not a good dude early on in our relationship and being able to hold and acknowledge that and say, Hey, I did some very fucked up things, but also have the context of the reasons why at the same time is so important. But I think what perpetuates suffering in the world is, is two things in my mind is for the, those who have been victimized, continually shaming those who have um, perpetuated the victimization, who have done wrong, right? That's one thing. But on the flip side of things, the inability of people who were doing wrong to simply acknowledge, hey, I did something wrong and I'm really sorry and just make amends and change their behavior. I think it's, it's both and it's more so the ownership uh, on part of the, the individual who is doing the wrong. And it's, it's like this, this line, this continual passing down of suffering, because more often than not, I would almost say in every case, the people who are inflicting suffering and pain upon others are themselves hurt and have not done the work to uproot their trauma and, and look at things and do the introspective work. But it's still not a, a, an excuse for the behavior, but it, it, but it's, it's important context and it's important context, especially for the people who have been victimized because they can understand why as an example, like in reflecting on how my dad was towards me when I was younger, what helped me heal from that was gaining an understanding of why he was behaving the way that he does not excusing him not excusing him, but gaining an understanding of why. And it's because he was raised in a very fucked up way by his parents. And it's not excusing him, but it helped me see why he was doing the things that he was doing. And it helped me then be able to, you know, see the innocence in him, so to speak, um, despite the behaviors being very harmful. And then it allowed me to no longer hold on to this resentment. And then when I let go of the resentment, six months later, apologize to me for the first time ever for the first time ever. There's something to that, man. I've, I've had cases of clients where we did some deep work for repairing their internal relationship to their parents and they may not have spoken to their parents. And like, I specifically remember one guy who hadn't talked to his mom in like 
four years or something. And within the week after the session, his mom called him out of the blue and they had like a pleasant conversation and reconciled some things. So is this like family con- constellation stuff? No, I'm just doing biofield tuning. Oh, okay. Just biofield. That's incredible though. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, all these different uh, methodologies for getting to the root of emotional trauma there, in my opinion, it's the, all the same thing that we're doing, but we're just speaking a different language, you know? And so it's about like, I think it's really crucial to just develop some proficiency in one of these languages, because then like I have, I've talked about this already, but like I had a right shoulder injury at the gym and I knew exactly what interpersonal dynamic with and with who that had just come up in the days before that I needed to resolve to allow the energy that was causing this shoulder injury to heal. And it's like, once you get that map, it's almost like a cheat code where everyone else is wandering around, like looking for the pill to fix it. It's, it's amazing because it allows you to really get to the root and it gives you the understanding, um, especially with the added layer of the reality that germ theory is nonsense, right? That virtually every physical symptom we are experiencing has an underlying emotional psycho spiritual element to it that overwhelmingly of course allopathic medicine doesn't acknowledge but dude i'll even say a lot of so-called alternative or holistic modalities to healing don't acknowledge them either i yeah, get they're so still in the nuts and bolts you need this thing for that yeah. thing I get so frustrated with functional medicine because that is a perfect example of it because it's literally just green allopathy. It's just, instead of uh, masking symptoms with a pill or a vaccine, it's simply just masking symptoms with a supplement. It's not attempting to get to the root. Yes. Supplements can help aid the recovery process or help you in along your healing journey. I don't want to say that they don't have any positive effect, but those things will keep reoccurring until you really get to the root of the issue. And that's why between biofield tuning and and German new medicine, those are like the two things that I'm super interested in lately because they actually address and are able to identify specifically symptomology relating to a certain type of, of trauma that you experienced. Absolutely, man. And like you said, the supplement side, isn't that it's worthless, but you, you can't just put a bandaid on a bullet wound. <laughs> you need to stop getting, stop shooting yourself in the foot <laughs> metaphorically. <laughs> I wanted to also go back around to like, you're talking about when you were young, your relationship to your wife and how like you weren't a good dude. Right. So I want to give this anecdotal story for people that may have times in their life that they look back on themselves and go, yeah, I recognize that I was shitty back then <laughs> because that in itself is a step, you know, to take ownership of the behavior and understand why the behavior was there. But then there's a further step of accepting (laughs) and loving yourself through that. So like for me, um, at the point that I, I, I spent years working a job I didn't really like to make ends meet while I was doing this on the side. And this was growing slowly and not as fast as I wanted. And I was feeling unsupported in it. And like, how do I get support for doing what I love that I think is actually helpful and good work for the world? Well, of course, getting into biofield tuning was really huge for all that. And there's many elements to how that helped me. But there was a point where I was at the office of this other job. And I, for some reason, stumbled upon the band that I was in when I was in high school. and. uh I'd had this story that I'd always, anytime I thought of myself from like 17, 18, 19, 20, I would imagine like, if I saw that kid as my current self, I would tell him off, like what a fucking idiot he is. And it struck me of like, well, wait, 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 wait. If I actually met that teenager as my current self, but it wasn't me, it was just somebody that was just like that. I would think a lot of positive things about that kid. You know, I would see the good in that kid. And I had this huge like moment of accepting and loving who I was back then, even though there was a lot of stuff I didn't know and a lot of problematic ego issues and unhealed trauma and whatever. And this was crucial because I came to understand later in the biofield anatomy theory 
that the yin side of ourself, the receptive, literally our ability to receive things is also connected to the energy of the past and the energy of the mother and the feminine in general. But at the point that I made this like acceptance of my past self and I was no longer holding this story of like what an idiot that guy was, I no longer, I, I got myself out of being projecting my well-being into some future destination or goal like i'll be okay when i have this or when i've achieved that because that's what happens when you're cutting off the receptive and the yin and the feminine you're operating purely from the masculine side and projecting everything into the future which is masculine oriented and so i accepted the past version of myself loved myself <laughs> and within um it was like a matter of weeks. I was no longer at that job that I'd been at for almost 10 years and was receiving more and more support for what it was I love to do. I was happy in the present moment. I felt like I was there instead of like projecting the there out into the future and everything just started coming together. So I want people to know that, that if there's a part of your past or your history, your old self that you're holding resentment towards <laughs> or have a story about that they suck, Try your, I lead people through this in biofield tuning all the time. Like imagine going and meeting that kid or that teenager, or that young person and appreciating them, loving them, telling them that they're great and they're going to be okay. <laughs> you know, no, I'm just not ignoring what you did wrong then, but you can recognize that you've grown past that. So you don't need to focus on that. You don't need to hold on to that as the story of who you were because you make it into who you are now to some mm. degree. Mm. Dude, that's powerful medicine for me. Cause like, as I'm looking, relooking at things relating to my mom, I'm doing that process right now, like still actively accepting and finding the innocence within myself at those points in my life. And it's, I think it's even things that were, were done to us quote air quotes, so to speak, it's, being able to find the innocence, not only in that person, but find the innocence in yourself and, and the conditioning um, that you succumb to that ultimately led to, to that happening, right? It, it's being able to find innocence in, in both the, the perpetrator and the so-called victim of that situation and understand that despite what they went through, they're still loved and they are still whole. <laughs> I'm glad we've made it to this point. <laughs> uh, thanks for the letting, you know, a psychoanalyze you and let the crowd draw <laughs> off of that to see their own self more clearly. Cause I think this is helpful. Like you said, that is powerful medicine yeah. and it affects our ability to receive support. hundred yeah. percent does. And <laughs> we all, we all deserve, you know, universe is this abundant place where everything you need is already present in the e environment of the present moment in the ecosystem you're in. And it's just a matter of being connected internally, all your energy body areas, if they're all connected and in communication, then in the external, what needs to go where will find its way because there aren't, you know, the external world is this reflection of your internal energy. So, yeah, but I want to do a bit of a pivot and talk about some of the, some of the highlights of most best information you can give us regarding the talks and presentations you give, such as at Music at Sky on science and the scientific method, you know, like what you've learned <laughs> through yeah. studying that. Yeah. So my diving into the scientific method. So let me give some context. I majored in systems engineering at West Point. I have not used that in a formal capacity whatsoever. Cause after graduating from West Point, like I said, in the army for five years, have to serve a minimum of five years active duty once you graduate. Um, so I served my five and got the F out in April of 2021. But um, I already had a really good understanding of uh, how to read scientific papers and how to determine whether a study um, was done properly, let's say, but I had never really taken something that was deemed accepted science and put it to the test in terms of, does it stand up to the scientific method? And it's because 
we assume on some level, I think all of us still do this to some degree in various aspects of our life that other people know better. And when, when a large amount of people believe something and they're so-called expert, then that must have already been studied regular, rigorously and be scientific. And what I mean by this, um, the cult of experts, the cult of experts. Yes. And it's crazy because just like the priests that, you know, they're yeah. the ones that have the connection to God. They're the experts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The like white coat brings into the world. The black robe takes it out of the world. They're two arms of the same cult. Wow. That was a good one. Is that your quote? Was that you? That's my buddy to say on. <laughs> okay, I was going to say that was, that was epic. Wow. Um, but uh, so even though I had be, like come to understand the fraud of allopathic medicine, the pharmaceutical industry, all of these things, I was still just accepting that virology was a real thing. And the best analogy I can use is that despite Santa Claus not existing for children, all of the things in their environment, I hope my kids didn't hear me. They're right outside this door. I don't want any judgment from any of the listeners either. Yes. In our, in our house, we still do Santa Claus. I know. How still, dare I, you? I know. I know. But okay. So you're Santaists. <laughs> or Santa is. But for, for kids, everything in their environment reifies the existence of Santa Claus. So when they see something, even if it's a hole in the, the idea that Santa Claus exists, they will make up in their mind excuses to why that happened to further, um, you know, reify the existence of Santa Claus. As an example, let's say you're using an app on your phone that is a sl Santa Claus sleigh tracking app, but then you're also watching you know, CNN and they're following tra Santa's trajectory across the sky and they're off. Like CNN is showing that Santa Claus is over Venezuela. And then your app is showing that Santa Claus is over California or something like that. You're going to make up an excuse in your mind rather than saying, oh, well, you know, why does this, why is this not adding up? Right. So the, the point that I'm trying to make here is when it came to the holes in my life of some people are getting sick, but other people aren't or um, virus, a virus is dead, but it can somehow do all these things. I would just make up an excuse in my mind and assume that someone knew better than I did for these glaring inconsistencies. And so when I first heard Andy Kaufman start speaking about virology, I began obsessively researching about it. And over the past year, I've come to understand that not only does virology not make sense logically at all and have viruses never been proven to exist, but most importantly, especially because the side that continually refers to people like you and me as pseudoscientific um, virology is quite literally by definition pseudoscientific. And here's why in order to be considered scientific, you need to strictly adhere to the scientific method. Pseudoscience, the very definition of it is anything that is claiming to be scientific, but does not strictly adhere to the scientific method. Virology in its foundational studies has never clearly identified an independent variable. The variable that you think is the cause for the observed phenomenon, which is the dependent variable. This is very basic scientific method stuff that we learned in third and fourth grade. And virology simply, um, do you mean to break down like what happens with virology specifically? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. This, this may come as a shock to people who haven't heard this before, but all of those images, the electron micrograph images that you see of a virus are not actually viruses. And what I mean by this is we assume that those must be things that were taken directly from the fluids of a sick person and then imaged the electron microscopy. Kind of like all those images of the earth from space are Photoshop and paintings. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's, 
it's it's more nefarious with this though because those are obvious like <laughs> those are those are much more obvious when you understand copy pasted clouds yeah. and shit. <laughs> yeah. I saw this one and I, I it's a, it was an official NASA um like you know how they put out the blue marble image once a year. It was the official NASA blue marble image from 2015 and then another one from 2019 and in the 2015 rendering uh North America is like one third of uh, takes up like one third of the globe. And then in the 2019 rendering, North America takes up like half of the globe. And I'm like, that's weird. How does this make sense? I like present it to people who still believe in NASA's lies. And of course they come up with a number of excuses, just like the Santa Claus thing, just like the virus thing. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just constantly outsourcing like, Oh, other people know better than me. So it must be true. So, which is, which is an appeal to authority. But so with virology, this is, this is what happens they take snot from a sick person. They assume that there is a virus inside the snot without ever validating that there is a virus or virus particles inside the snot whatsoever. They then take that snot and put it on a monkey kidney cell, which is a Vero cell culture alongside cytotoxic antibiotics and antimycotics like amphotericin B, gentamicin, trypsin, uh, penicillin streptomycin. Then they also add fetal bovine serum and then they add minimal nutrient medium, which means they're giving the cell the minimal amount of nutrients in order to maintain its viability. All these things they are putting onto the culture, and there's various reasons why they, you know, according to them, put on amphotericin B as an example. They'll say they're putting that on there to keep out fungus, to keep the, the, the cell culture in a sterile environment, right? Although amphotericin B, oddly enough, if you look up the side effects to amphotericin B, one of the most common side effects is acute renal failure. So let's think about this. They have a monkey kidney cell. Amphotericin B, they're putting onto a monkey kidney cell. One of the most common side effects of amphotericin B is kidney failure. So of course, that is going to damage the cell. So they're putting all these things onto the culture alongside this unpurified snot from a sick person that they assume contains a virus, but never, there, no time in history has a virus ever been imaged directly from the fluids of a sick person. So they take all those things, mix it together. The cell breaks down into a bunch of fragments. They then take those fragments, prepare them for electron microscopy. And then we have these electron micrograph images that we've seen shared all over the news pointing to the virus and saying, oh, these are, this is SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is simply a byproduct of a toxic cell culture. There is, SARS-CoV-2 has never actually been discovered inside of a human being or inside the fluids of a human being. And when you just go back and list all the components of that proof experiment that they do, it sounds like the ingredients to some kind of demonic conjuring. You know, it's like some weird fucked up alchemy, not, (laughs) that's not, how is that science? Because how I, how I understand science in the most pure sense too, is like you are looking to figure out what happens in nature Yes, without us, without our intervention. So as soon as you start doing all these crazy levels of artifice, we have left the realm of nature. 100%. And so this is a really important point that you just made, actually. So there's, this is, this is where science can become self-refuting. It's really funny. There's three branches of science. There's formal sciences, which, which deals with logic, math, reasoning. They're not bad things at all. Those are, those are useful tools. And I'll get to why formal sciences itself is not scientific, ironically. So formal sciences, like I said, math, science, or math, logic, reasoning, statistics, uh, social sciences, which is like archaeology, paleontology. <laughs> um, I don't know if we want to go down that rabbit hole right now, but archaeology, paleontology, studying cultures. And then there's natural sciences. Natural sciences, per science's own definitions, is the only one that employs the scientific method. And again, going back to the definition of pseudoscience, in order to be scientific, you need to strictly adhere to the scientific method. So formal sciences and social sciences are fundamentally pseudoscientific because they're claiming to be scientific, but they don't employ the scientific method. So when it comes to natural sciences, you made a, you made a really important point. In order for it to um, be natural sciences, you have to have an observed phenomenon that is occurring in nature, meaning that is unmanipulated by man, right? In this case, let's say of, of infectious, so-called infectious diseases, 
um, the observed phenomenon is multiple people getting sick with symptoms in the same space, right? That, that is a genuine observed phenomenon. What happens in the cell culture is not, of course, they're conjuring that up. That is then manipulated by man. So that is also not scientific, but let's just stay within the realm of so-called infectious diseases for a second to see where they misstep severely. You have a legitimate observed phenomenon, multiple people getting sick in the same space, right? That is a natural observed phenomenon. In order to try to figure out what is the cause of that phenomenon, you develop a hypothesis. The hypothesis in this case could be, um, I think because all of these people are having uh, respiratory symptoms, they're all coughing and sneezing, there must be something inside the fluids that is being passed between these people that is causing this observed phenomenon, right? So then you would need to actually find the thing that you think is the cause. In the case of virology, you would need to find the virus or viruses to then see if these things are the cause of people getting sick. And I want to be clear about this. Virology has never taken a virus or viruses directly from the fluids of a sick person. Every single time they have, um, quote, isolated viruses, they use the exact same process I just described where they assume there is a virus inside the fluids. They add it to a culture alongside all of these other substances, which are confounding variables, right? And then the cell culture breaks down to a bunch of fragments. They then take those fragments after all those things have been added to the culture and point to them and say, oh, these are the viruses. This must be what was causing people to get sick. It is fundamentally pseudoscientific because first off, they manipulated everything. So that's not a natural observed phenomenon. Second, they don't do any control experiments. And then three, the independent variable was not clearly identified before proceeding with experimentation. In order to say that you or that this thing is the cause of this observed phenomenon, you need to have that thing, the independent variable, the presumed cause to then vary and manipulate by itself to see if it produces the effect, the observed phenomenon, people getting sick. Virology has never done this. So when you simply ask any virologist to show you, or molecular biologist or any so-called expert to show you where virology has strictly adhered to the scientific method and what the independent variable is, they can't do it. They skirt the question and then, well, red herring, red herring, red herring, bring up something to distract from the point, use an ad hominem or appeal to authority. Get emotional to and angry. Yes. Yes. So virology is fundamentally pseudoscientific. I think that this is really crucial. And I have a lot of points that I want to return to, to go further into like what I think virology might be and get your thoughts on why it's going on. But we should probably give at least the next 10 or 15 minutes in the free hour to talking about your membership organization and your podcast and the things you're building, you know, like this is very fascinating, <laughs> the subject we've been opening up here, but we have plenty of time for that in the second hour. And I want everyone to be able to hear really all about the, uh, you know, the good and true and beautiful that you're bringing to the world, not just the spells that you're destroying, <laughs> which is yeah. also really good. Yeah. Thanks, man. So, um, the way forward is a membership platform that we just launched that we will have, of course, exclusive podcast episodes, very similar to this setup where we have first hour, hour and a half free. And then the second half, um, uh, will be recorded at another date though. And the, um, members will be able to ask questions directly to that podcast guest. And, um, we'll also have, footage from all of our previous in-person and virtual events. We just did a virtual summit. That was a, a three-day summit, had some amazing uh, speakers and presentations. So all the footage from that. And what was that called? Members. That was called the way forward summit. It was our, our inaugural summit. And then also uh, this, this is a long story, but our health freedom for humanity symposium was an in-person event that we had 650 attendees and 24 speakers. We have purchased the rights to that. So that is also on our membership, all the talks from that. Um, some incredible talks over the course of two days that was in Kansas city and you're not far from there, man. So I wish I would have known about you at that point. I would have invited you to speak. I would have been there. Uh, yeah. Well, well, we'll do it again. We'll do it again. <clears throat> and then the other thing that we're building that we're Super yeah, we're both Missouri guys. How about I, that? Dude, I, well, I'm a Kansas guy, but you know, it's the same thing. Kansas basically. City is basically the same thing. We're mid Midwestern boys. Um, and uh, 
the the other thing that we're building that we're super 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 excited about is called Source, and it's a freedom oriented and holistic health oriented business directory that is free for any business to become a part of. Right now, it only exists for our membership, meaning in order to access the business directory, you have to be a member of the way forward. But once we reach a certain threshold of businesses, and we're still building, we have. Uh, we're in the triple digits now, but we're still building the amount of businesses we have on there. Um, once we reach a certain threshold, this will be launched publicly. And what's awesome about it is it's, it'll be a public tool that anyone can use and it will eventually turn into an app that'll be on the app store. But what's unique about ours is that you'll see a number of businesses on the directory that give discounts in-person discounts and virtual discounts to members of the way forward. And we already have over half the businesses on there. And again, it's completely free for a business to be a part of this directory that are giving specific discounts to anyone who has a membership to the way forward. And we have an actual printable membership card associated with our membership. So you can print that off and then go to businesses across the world. We already have international businesses on our membership. It's pretty incredible um, that you can present and then receive a discount on a product or services or initial consultation or anything like that. It's obviously depending on what the business offers, but we're really stoked about this because we think this could turn into a pretty clever play on the, the Vax passport on the you know freedom and holistic health side of things. So um, yeah, if you have a business, please, uh, go to our website and fill out the business directory form. If you just go to the wayforward.com, um, you should be able to find it there. That is such an amazing resource and yeah, you're building, which is what we got to do when <laughs> it's not really about tearing down the old system as Buckminster Fuller says, it's about creating something that can outcompete it and make it obsolete. So in terms of the building, what are the pillars you're building on? I know you have like six pillars in your creed. Can we touch on that? So people can hear, you know, what the full alignment of your organization and your mission is. Yeah. So with my previous organization that I was running, it was a nonprofit and I'm so happy to be out of that space now because that was operating within an organization that was fundamentally attached to the government while speaking out against the government, probably not a good look. So <laughs> I've, I've transitioned away from that. And there's the whole story on. Well, what they, it, they that. make it sound like that's the, the good guy way to go, but then no. you start playing in their realm and yeah, dude, it's, it, it's not. And, and it was, I mean, there's a number of reasons that I ended up dissolving that organization and um, people can actually find that episode explaining what happened. If they look up uh, episode one of the way forward with Alex Zek, and it just released today, actually went through this whole process of having to purchase the rights to former podcast that was health Freedom free Manny, this whole thing. But anyway, you can find out all the details. If you look up episode one, it's titled what happened to it's like you versus yourself. Dude, it is. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid. Anyway. So health freedom is what I was focused on the last two and a half years. And I will say within the organization that I was the executive director of, it, it was an incredible organization. We had chapters in 22 States, three countries. We we're growing exponentially for a period of time. Our podcast was one of the top 50 health and fitness podcasts in the United States for a three month period. And then we started struggling with insane amounts of censorship, yada, yada, yada. But health freedom is one aspect is, is just one piece. And as these agendas continue to unfold, if we just focus on that one piece, we are severely missing out on so many other things that are equally, if not more important to, the, to understanding health freedom. And so our six pillars for the way forward are health freedom is one of them still, but then health and wellness. And health and wellness is distinct in that it is focusing on things that make us well discovering top topics like biofield tuning, German new medicine, these other things. It's not focusing on the, the harms, if you will, like th those things are still important for people to understand the harms of vaccines, the harms of masking, the harms or the, the lies of germ theory, but it's also equally, if not more important to discuss the things that are maintaining our wellness. Right. And then our, our third pillar is consciousness. Our fourth pillar 
uh, is, is a pretty open-ended one. And this will allow us to explore topics like flat earth, the truth about nine 11, these other things. And that's questioning the narrative. Our fifth pillar is land. And that is we're we're heavily focusing on regenerative agriculture. In fact, as part of our membership, we already have tons of content from a friend of mine who's a regenerative farmer, Molly Engelhart. She's um, she'll be coming on once a month to answer questions about farming and gardening, which would be really cool. And that'll be ex- exclusive for our members. And then the, the sixth pillar is community and law. And this is a pretty broad one, but the three main topics that we're going to be focusing on with that is common law and the understanding that we are already free and they manipulate us into giving our consent and they manipulate us into contracting with them in order to uh, carry out these tyrannical agendas. Because I'll say this, everything that has happened, and I can only speak specifically to the United States, of course, there are actual tyrannical governments who are quite literally forcing people into to positions. But I'll also say that what leads to that happening to, to, to a government like that rising up is the continual perpetuated belief that authority is legitimate. That's what leads to those types of governments existing. Not right, not left. It's, it's the belief in authority that is the problem. Belief that other men and women who simply call themselves government have a right to dictate, to give commands, and then have the exclusive moral justification to use force for those who don't comply. It, that belief is the problem. And so what we'll be talking about is common law, um, voluntarism, and then also homeschooling and unschooling. So those are the three main points of focus for, for that section of our, of our pillars. And we'll be exploring all those topics. We'll have courses on them, um, obviously podcast episodes, and pretty, pretty stoked about it. I love it, man. I uh, especially think that I would like to come in on the questioning the narrative side and sort of branching it into the, the uh, questioning authority aspect too, because one of my big goals is to demonstrate why the system that we have as government is actually the mafia and that it, the mafia is also the religious <laughs> institutions that are the the big ones how those the church and state never split no you know we're all under this roman uh vatican system still and it's always been a mafia and demonstrating how uh we actually don't need those intermediaries for our spiritual growth or connection to the divine Mm -hmm. that we need to abrogate the systems that give the entire uh, impetus for authority. Right. So yeah, we have to, we have a lot of disentangling of knots to get the whole Messiah out of our (laughs) collective consciousness and get back to uh, the real inner alchemy where the salvation is within instead of an external solvent <laughs> making you insolvent by uh, t- 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 turning you from gold to lead. <laughs> can I, can I tie in one more point here too? Please, it kind of yeah. relates to what we were talking about with like victimization and, 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 you know, v- victims and perpetrators at the beginning. Um, everything that's happened in the last two and a half years that happened with COVID, if people understood that freedom is not something that comes, that is given, that is exchanged with any other men and women, even if they are calling themselves government, none of this would have happened. If people understood that they are already free by virtue of existing and freedom is an expression of something from within with inside them, none of this would have happened. And I get frustrated with the so-called health freedom community now because They're so focused on legislation, just getting the right guy in office at the federal level or the, even the state level, or, um, you know, focused on petitioning the government, pleading with them. And all you're doing in those acts is you are acknowledging you have authority over me and I don't like it. I want the authority that you have over me to be different. I don't want it to be this way rather than dissolving the illusion of authority altogether because none of this would have happened over the past two and a half years if people simply understood that men and women who quote who call themselves quote government are simply just men and women and they actually have no authority over them authority is not real it is a conditioned belief if people just simply chose to express themselves and be free 
none of this would have happened over the last two and a half years. Absolutely, man. And yeah, there's more to say about that in hour two, but uh, last question before we go, do you take one-on-ones for anything? Uh, I am starting to take one-on-ones in two months. So in January, I will be starting to take one-on-ones. Okay, cool. So people follow Alec and if they want to work with you directly, I'm assuming on like health related yep. issues or fitness related issues, right? Just essentially, I this is such a cliche buzzword term now, but like mind, body, spirit coaching, just taking one-on-ones with regards to that. Yeah, it is a cliche, but it's also, I don't see how we could have too much of that. You know? Agree. <laughs> I don't see how you can have too much of that. There's a lot, there's a lot of people in the more that in the world and the more of us are able to be of authentic service like that, the more one to one time we have with those that actually need the help. And, you know, we're not burning out the people that are the best at it. I see no problem with more and more people getting into these. Uh, I don't even like the word alternative because that says alter native. So let's yeah. just say <laughs> the, the more native perspectives, but we'll uh, hop over to hour two. Alec, it's been really fun. I have a great list of further subjects to dive into. So appreciate your time today. And I'm excited to continue and maybe come talk to you on your platform and definitely be involved in more real life in-person events together, dude. Amen, man. Thank you so much for having me, Chance. And thank you all for tuning in. Yo, yo, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Another extremely enjoyable episode, of course. And I love getting to know my new buddy, Alec, better. We had such an awesome time at Music and Sky. I'll probably say that over and over again. Could not recommend that event more highly. And also, like, mad props to Alex for doing, or Alex, <laughs> Alec. When you say Alec, Zach, it's like saying Alex. So forgive me. But Alec, mad props for all the stuff that he's building in the world. Like, you know, he's a young man. He's even younger than me, I think, a year or two under my age. And he's got this huge, huge ambition to build something that people can connect to in the real world. He's doing events in person where he can and, you know, involving other people with this business. I find that very admirable to, you know, for comparatively to what I do, where it's like, <laughs> I seem to have a bit of a block about like getting other people involved with the uh, production and the the back end and the inside aspect of podcasting. I just want to do it all myself, but you know, we're, we're doing different things and that's fine. I don't know why I needed to give all that disclaimer, but I want everyone to know that they can go to the way forward.com, but it's forward is F W R D. So it's the way F R F do sorry, the way F W R D.com. And you can catch up with all the stuff that he's been putting out and maybe even see where there could be upcoming events like sign up for the email list. There's a telegram channel for the way forward that will also give you great updates on what's happening in that particular world of, you know, <laughs> finding better ways to approach every aspect of wellness from the mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, you know, the entire gamut. So i I really appreciate that. I enjoyed this conversation a lot. I also thought it was pretty cool how if you caught the vibrant from Wednesday, uh, we recorded this talk, me and Alec, a while back. But if you caught the vibrant from Wednesday, there's actually a lot of overlapping ideas here where we're talking about getting our self-knowledge on and connecting the dots about what type of emotional issues we might have had in childhood, you know, develop through maybe no fault of our parents really, you know, considering modern society, but that when we connect the dots of like, this is the emotional flavor and experience that gave me the type of mm, fragmenting in my energy body that leads to certain recurring issues that I've got. Once you have that knowledge and you can really see the path behind you and connect every aspect of it, that is really huge for connecting with the way forward <laughs> for you as a person. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm always thinking about like, what does this little injury mean? And don't look at me like I'm some kind of perfected guru master. Like I busted my foot yesterday. Uh, sad story. Actually, I was throwing balls for my dogs and I 
was chasing the ball, trying to beat the dog to it and decided like at the last second, I'm going to do this little soccer kick move and kick the ball. And the dog goes to chomp it at that exact time. And I actually kicked my dog in the head. Like who does that? And it seemed like my dog was way better uh, off than I was. My foot was pretty busted from the dog's head. So anyway, that whole story aside, now I'm thinking like my right foot got an ouchie on it. Am I considering, you know, on the unconscious level that I'm on the wrong path or do I not trust my path? And I feel like I do, but I can't separate any kind of injury or dis-ease that I might be feeling from the map of the biofield and understanding that from, you know, experiential level from all the tunings I've been doing for clients, which by the way, there are spaces still open in December if you want to get in on some tuning. It's been nonstop incredible. Every session is like great breakthroughs, great connection. Uh, We laugh even, (laughs) you know, it's fun. It's actually a fun way to do the energy work and learn more about yourself. And even if what comes up are things that you've already done uh, some self-work on and some healing for, there are certain wound points, if you want to call them that, for all of us that are sort of integral to our identity and our character and our persona and revisiting them from time to time, even if we think that we've sort of got that cleared out, you never know. There might be a little bit still lingering there or further perspective to gain about yourself from revisiting past experiences. And the great thing about the biofield tuning is that it'll come up in a way that's like synchronistic. Like you won't even have told me this happened at this age. And I'll be like, okay, so what was going on with your dad at age 11 or whatever. And I I use that example because I find I'm I'm like learning. There's like a, an interesting science of correlations to it all that I'm learning more about with each and every client. And one of them that I found as a commonality for people that for women that have asthma, that there seems to be like an absent father or a father being, you know, deceased at an early age. So maybe that helps somebody out there who's suffering from asthma. Like, Maybe it has to do with your relationship to your dad. (laughs) Maybe you could help yourself out by going more deeply into that um, experience and like letting yourself feel some of the unprocessed grief from that. You know, that could be what's going on with the the constriction in the chest. They're definitely related. So anyway, I want to give you guys like, you know, a bit of the uh, data on what we did in hour two. If you're interested in hearing the second part of this conversation, which you can get on Rockfin or Patreon, links will be in the show notes, but those are the best ways to support Interverse, which is just me. And you can get the second hour of all the main show conversations. Very, very worth it. You get a huge archive to tap into. And in this one, a a couple of the key points we talked about are how freedom is inherent to our being. It's not about a piece of paper. It's not about a government regulation, not about a constitution or a bill of rights. It's about knowing yourself and your creator and your jurisdiction with the creator, with the all, you know, the self-existing intelligence of the cosmos. Then we talked about how, uh, like who owns the science? <laughs> I'll give you a clue. Uh, it might have to do with tiny hats. And that was kind of funny, but also pretty deep. And then we discussed the, uh, you know, Alec has a background in the military. So we talked about exorbitant military spending and how that relates into the alchemy of economics and maybe a big picture that helps us comprehend why things are going the way they're going in our society, that it's very related to the flow of current or energy or currency and how and why things have to work the way that they do for our system to continue being patched up and moving along. Then I asked him some questions about what he thinks on the concept of the venom uh, technology in terms of bio weapons or environmental poisons in general. And yeah, I I have some perspective on that from the symbolism side that I think that there's maybe some veracity to it. Uh, But it was an interesting conversation because he's so deep into the study of like, what was cooties? Why did it happen? You know, terrain, not germ, all of that. Really great. Uh, We also talked about bioresonance as a possible vector for people you know, spreading seeming contagions. And this has to do with water, the programming of water, something I want to explore more. I mean, are we ever going to get to the bottom of the cup when it comes to the water question and how important that is? Probably not. 
Uh, so all that being said, I'd love to see you guys come on to hour two and check out what we got going on. And we also are going to play you out with a, well, first, before I say that, email me, chance at interversepodcast.com. If you want to do a card reading, we can get into the I Ching. We can do also a tuning. We can combine the two things. Get in there. Get yourself booked for December. If you want to do it before the end of the year, great way to kick off the next year. And like, you know, winter time's a great point for rest, recharge, detox, clearing out the cobwebs of your energy body and giving yourself a stronger foundation to go forward, the way forward, yeah. <laughs> but okay, so we're gonna play out with a song called El Gato by my buddy Dean, AKA Lucid. I enjoyed this one a lot, it's a brand new one and I will talk to you guys later. Thanks for tuning in, much love, bye-bye.